generation. Um, and here's the grammar. It's uh, 135, so I'm only going to have a little while to do this today. A little while meaning a couple hours. Um, but we're going to get to it. It's kind of exciting because we're back to cogeneration. I already did a little of this uh, some about a week or two back. Um, it, before we kind of, I kind of arrived at this 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 um, this uh, this notion of a of a definition with both a parse uh, function and a scan function. That was a that was a pretty big discovery that that when we moved here. What was that two weeks ago? Uh, I'm really glad that I had that that breakthrough. I think it's really going to make a difference going forward. Uh, including use of Boolean logic and returning true or false uh, for each of the scan parts. Those of you who've got more of a formal computer science background are probably like, well, duh. But for me, that was that was quite a breakthrough. And uh, by the way, this method of education, by just throwing yourself into it and learning it and and associating with other people who have done it, so that's very much what Paulo Freire, um, you know, would have you, everyone do. And I'm just really excited that that this book. Um, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed is just really confirming uh, this whole approach like you know rather than teach and speaking of which uh, before we get going too much let me just one other thing so I actually did write this down <laughs> I started writing a mantra uh, a, a COC code of conducts have been in the news again because of the whole uh, this this one that this dude made from Coinbase who's causing all kinds of controversy so actually, I actually decided to make my own uh, code of conduct for myself, uh, just kind of as a joke, but also to help me remember. So here it is. Uh, and yeah, I, I fail, but you know, I want to have something to fall. Chill the fuck out. Don't get mad. Get busy. What if everybody did it? Give the benefit of the doubt. Don't teach. And this is what reminded me of it. Learn, show, and share. And that's consistent with uh, the best form of learning. Um, go outside, remind your body you're human. Don't consume, create. Dance and sing, live without and give. <clears throat> so that's those are my my personal code of conduct things. I thought that was kind of fun. I just mentioned it while we're waiting for people to trickle in. Um, we never get a particularly big crowd here, and that's okay. I, this is not stuff that interests everybody. Um, it's interesting though because the people that it does interest uh, tend to be, uh, you know, then influential to, to help others as well. So it's been fun to fun to do. So we got this definition here. And uh, we're doing this. Yeah, I apparently I have to mute because I'm being interrupted again. All right, nothing big there. So here we have the definition. Um, I have the definition there. I have the definition here. This one has a parse function. Uh, why is that? Well, that's because uh, pagan notation has. Um, uh, the idea of like convenience, I call them scan defs. Um, and, uh, and then those that are more significant, which should be able to be parsed. And I call those node defs. Uh, node defs have the two dashes and the scan defs have one. And that's a nice way to give a hint to, uh, any sort of code generator, uh, or validator that, uh, that you don't actually need to have a parse function for those things. So this is what, this is an example of. We just have a scan function here for uh, for an octal digit. We don't need to have um, a parse function as well. Parse function is pretty much the same as a scan function. The difference is is that it bookmarks it and then it it creates a node and returns that, which is a lot of extra work if you don't need to do it. Uh, and when it gets, when it comes time to doing like real time validation, which we keep trying, failing to do because we really need the whole thing finished uh, before we can do that step, uh, then we can go on to that. Speaking of which, uh, here's where we are where we are starting the generator we just i just cleared out we we finished the json test uh catch everybody up i did this off this off stream so i'll just show everybody um so i added a uh inside of our test suite suite here for node tree i added um two uh two tests to check for uh successful ast parsing of the long form uh and the ast json and then short form so those are there, and these are actually all they're doing is they're just they're just loading up the they're loading up the JSON string, uh, and then they're unmarshaling it into an object, and then they're remarshaling it back out as a string again, so that we can compare 
uh, to the original JSON and see if it if it passes. So this just proves that it can go through the cycle without any without any changes. Uh, that sort of thing, by the way, uh, I suspect would not be possible had we not used. And I'm, I cannot tell you all these little tiny decisions I've made, which have just really come to roost as being helpful. Uh, if I had done this as a map, uh, you know, otherwise called the JavaScript object, one of the worst names ever invented for a thing, uh, you know, and we're talking about a, an associative array, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but by using arrays, uh, everything not only is faster, but it's also guaranteed to be, to be in a particular order. So that means com uh, comparisons like I've just done uh, don't ever get the risk, no matter what language you get is implemented in, of, of being like out of order. Uh, if you were to do this using, you know, an object, you would you would have all kinds of problems, right? Because or using a map, because you wouldn't be guaranteed the, the order, even though if your language does guarantee the order, not all languages would. And so, by doing this as an array, uh, it's it's much faster. It's also much easier to test, and um, super happy with that. Anyway. Uh, in case you're wondering too, uh, I also got all the new numbers into the master branch. Uh, so the master branch has been committed with all the new definition numbers, uh, and we got rid of the you know the negative numbers for 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 a while there. We had negative numbers for for the um, for the scan defs, and we had positive numbers for the node defs, and that's all gone. We just have everything is just a def, and everything gets a number depending on what order it appears here. Uh, so let me see lots of awk that we were doing yesterday. I'm finding one get really, okay. Well, let's just do this. So this is this, so this over here is the number and that way people can extract the numbers pretty easily. In fact, it took me like less than five minutes to get the numbers to build the, um, the, the arrays so that we could update the master yesterday. So all good stuff. Very happy with it so far. Um, and now we're getting into the, the real benefit and um, kind of excited because all this work up to now has been kind of like, you know, the preparation for, you know, these really amazing things you can do once you have a node tree, uh, including, you know, code generation, but validation and, and, and all kinds of amazing things um, because you have that tree that you can now walk. Right. And let's let's do that. Uh, so what do I mean by walk a tree? So if you're new to Go or you're new to CompSci or graph, graph theory, um, and you know, and I don't, I don't have a real steep education in it. I've, everything I've learned, I've had to read about in the recent, recent months. Um, and you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, I believe in reading things as needed, uh, not necessarily, I mean, it's fine to, you know, open your head like a bank and deposit all the money in there, uh, that you might eventually need, but that's, you know, like the banking model model of education that Paula Ferrari talks about being horrendous and hey, look at media. And so, uh, you know, but I, it makes so much more sense to me to learn these kind of things as we go. So here's what a node is. So a node is a rooted graph. Uh, so in order to, to go forward with the rest of today without really confusing people, I'm going to go ahead and describe what that is really quickly. So, uh, I have a book on this. It's called intro to algorithms. It's considered the Bible. Um, and, of 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 you know data structures and algorithms university instruction um this pdf i have uh legally because i have purchased a copy of the book um you know you make your own decisions there i do not judge people particularly internationally who are unable to pay 75 dollars for a textbook uh when they could you know get get it some other way hmm. it's an unpopular opinion with academia i don't give a fuck um so here here you go uh, this is, this is what a rooted node tree is just so you know. Uh, and that's, I, we had to construct this some time ago. Um, it is a good book. Uh, and I do believe in compensating people, uh, appropriately for their content and output. I do not disagree with that at all. Uh, charging $80 for a book that everyone is forced to have is not appropriate. Um, so, so here we go. We have these nodes in here and they know to, they know about each other and um and so we're going to do a depth depth first so this is what's going to happen uh use the pdf 90 percent of the time yeah yeah most people do so um yeah you know, I, I look i pay i'm an american and i you know i make enough money to live on so i buy the books uh but i refuse to judge other people you got to use one for 15 bucks oh my gosh you're lucky Lucky. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. You know, that's the kind of, that's, you know, 
free market forces applying in ways that so that would be too much money for somebody in Brazil or, you know, yeah, I, whatever. I just I have to stop talking about that. I don't want to get distracted. <laughs> but thank you. So so we're going to do a depth first. This is what depth first means. It means we go to the. Um, yeah, tell the info was there. We, we go to the top one and then we go to this one. And and then from here, we don't go like this. We go like this. We go to all of its children in order. So it has it. And then each child does it have a child. No, we go to this child. Okay, then we go down here. Then we come back up here. Then we go over here. And then we say, okay, I'm going to go here. Then I'm going to go to this child. And then I'm going to go over here, here, down, 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 here. And then back up here. And then I'm going to go over here, down, down, up, and then over here. Uh, so that is how you do a depth first traversal uh, of of a rooted no tree. Uh, and this, this by the way, this no tree, uh, I understand, somebody correct me if they know better, uh, is is a representation of a graph. Uh, the graph data structure is whatever, it's basically just a network. Uh, this particular one has a root. And so uh, this version of a, of a graph um, data structure is, is known as a rooted no tree. And um, that's, that's from my reading. If anybody out there has more to offer there, I really appreciate you guys giving us some clarity on that. But uh, I'm not, yeah, anyway, we're going to be doing a lot of more of this later. I, I eventually I want to work through the book, Data Structures and Algorithms, Mastering Data Structures in C, uh, which goes through this as well from a very practical perspective. Um, and I'm just going to mention it now just in case anybody wants to get into this stuff. Um, Mastering Algorithms in C, I have this book as well. This is all darker, dark moded. So this is a fantastic book. It's really old. It's nice. Like Kyle is like one of my heroes. Uh, he worked in he worked in aerospace, and all of his applications of data structures and algorithms have been very practical. And he he talks about that in his introduction about removing the academic speak, um, and uh, just really love it. So if you want to learn that, uh, C by the way is still the number one language in the world. Um, so I'll be learning. Uh, I, I know C, but I'm going to be doing a lot more C after this. Um, and, uh, because I think those are, I think that's, those are the really core languages that I personally want to learn. Uh, bash, I use bash every day, all the time. Uh, and go, which is the number, I mean, I swear to God, it is the number one DevOps language right now. And it's starting to emerge that way. People are starting to say that. Um, and C is the other one. Uh, any other language besides those three languages for me, uh, is going to be a matter of, oh, I have to know this language because something's already written in it. Uh, but for all of my personal Greenfield projects, uh, I don't plan on writing any C++ kind of code, in which case I would probably use root. Uh, how is the book dark themed? Um, this is me. Uh, I can give you a little hint on that. I have a little PDF script. You can you can you can go check on. Now, note to you, uh, I actually had to compile MU PDF in order to get the dash I option. That's the one that inverts it. Uh, it was a little bit tricky, actually, because, you, you know, it's hard to identify the proper version of MUPDF uh, in order to get the one that has inverted. Everybody was saying, yeah, use dash capital I. And I'm like, I can't find it. It's not in every, any of the official released ones. So you might have to compile your own MUPDF. If you want a copy of this this command, I'll give it to you right now. There you go. You go have a peek at that. Um, that's the command that allows me to, uh, I can actually, now that I have dash C, I have this um, little, little side note here. So uh, because, um, uh, I've also got this set up so that it does, um, this is, well, let's see, usage LN, mm, I might have to give you that one too. Give usage LN. Yeah. Let me give you that one too. I have a bunch of scripts, uh, and, and they are all in my, uh, dot files. So my dot files is at GitLab, Rob, RWX, Rob dot files and go pilfer through there. I have a lot of, I do the Unix method, right? So I have a lot of things that depend on other things. So it's hard for me to just give you one. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to explain this. Uh, this little, these magical little lines right here uh, are what allow me to do com tab, tab completion. And I'm going to give you a really quick whirlwind tour and, and tab completion with Bash. This is the reason I use Bash and not Z shell. One of the major reasons. What I'm about to do can't be done in Z shell. Uh, so, so, PDF is just a command, right? Uh, if I were to do any other command like ls and push tab twice, it would show me all the stuff in the current directory. That's the default behavior for for tab completion. Um, however, if you do, if you if you put into your program, uh, if you put into your program like a, a, a list function that just all it does is list all the PDF directories in my 
and I could probably have done this with grep or something or another version of LS, but I, I'm a big, I like find I've been using it a lot. Um, so you put a little list function inside of your, inside of your application, and then you can use your, your script or your app to do its own tab completion. You don't have to write a separate script. You can put it in there. You can be in Golang, who cares? And, and then when you, so, you know, it's actually one of the commands. So I can do PDF list and it shows me all the commands. Um, but then here comes the magic. When you add this, when you check for comp line, and this is explained, you know, way deep down in the bash man page, which everybody should read beginning to end. If you actually want to learn bash, it's the only way to learn it. Everything else is incomplete. Uh, and if you learn, if you learn about comp line, you'll learn about one tiny little thing. And that is that you can put the prefix in here, cut them all up, uh, and then grab the prefix out. So all this has to do, uh, so what this says is, am I being executed in tab completion context? So anytime you run a pro piece of code where you do, you type, you hit tab, when you hit tab two times, it runs this, it, it runs the completion code uh, and sets the environment variable comp env. Uh, and when it sets that environment variable, you can put the code inside of your actual application and say, look, if I, if I have a comp line set, then that means that I, this code is being executed in the context of tab completion and not to do what it's, you know, what it's otherwise going to do. So you can include the tab completion code within the same code that does whatever you want. So, so that way, and then all you have to do to activate that is in your bash RC, add the lines, uh, PD, uh, uh, let's see, complete dash C PDF PDF. And that says in order to complete the PDF command, run the PDF command and set the environment variables, as I mentioned. So now I can do a PDF tab tab and I can, I can complete anything I want. I can make it complete. You know, if it was a date command, I can make it complete dates and stuff. Uh, at some point I'll do an entire video on tab on just how drop dead simple tab completion is and how powerful it is. Uh, using bash and it's it's one of the overwhelming reasons to use um, to use bash a, a above Z shell not that and exported functions a bunch of other reasons um, so anyway that was a little bit of a sidetrack I apologize for that hopefully that's useful to somebody um, but yeah so those are the those are the commands okay so now what do I need to do today uh, and I, I don't have a lot of time I'm probably going to be streaming until about four o'clock today uh, I'm really hoping I can get at least the first form of, of generation done. What's the goal today? So the goal for me today is to get this to be created automatically. And there's a lot of things in here that have to, this, this one I created with a shell script yesterday. It was actually a one-liner um, shell script someplace. I have it someplace still. In fact, you want to see it? <laughs> I probably have it somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. It was actually a really fun one. People are like, what? Somebody said, uh, somebody said, Ken Thompson would be proud. Um, so where was it? Uh, let me see if I can find it. But it's just a recap. So you know, I I don't like awk that much, but it, what it's really good at is 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 you know taking the columns of output and printing them out in a nice happy way. Uh, so there we go. So this was this was uh, this was some code that I wrote to uh, to extract. So this says go go for every one of the definition lines and 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 then uh, and then put the line number in front of it. That gives me the ID, right? And then split up the lines so that I have, uh, and put a quote around it, and then put a comma. So I was able to do that and spit that out to a file, and then all I had to do after that was was put it in here. Uh, I did another one, actually, that, that uh, is a little bit more involved, that has the, um, the, the actual number in it. Uh, and it, it probably has a dollar one in it. So let's go see. Um, no, nope, don't see it now. Don't see it. It was around, it was the same one. It was around this one, but it was the same thing. All you have to do is just, you know, put a dollar one in there, a cool one, and then you can like do that. So that's, that's those are one liners. Those are really valuable. And then, uh, of course, the, the Go plugin did all the other formatting for me. All right, so <clears throat> these things are all well and good, but I need to be able to generate these things automatically from the JSON. And what does the JSON look like? Well, the JSON is is uh, already, this is the thing I spent so much time fixing last, yesterday. This is the JSON, right? Uh, but more importantly, um, this is the JSON that matters, and it's going to be very unintelligible, but this is the JSON that has all the numbers in it. This is the main one we're going to be parsing. Um, 
and this is deliberately dense like this because we want the least amount of overhead when we're when we're debugging and when we're parsing an AST. So just so you know, Pagan, just to review, Pagan has a, a, a serialized or a marshaled um, uh, short form, which is designed for transfer and, and um, you know, wicked fast parsing, so it can be combined with other ASTs. And, and then we have the long form for testing and debugging and human reading and stuff. They're the same, and both can be sent to the Peg and Go package and, and, and unparsed, unmarshaled just fine into, into node trees. Uh, but this is this is what we have, and so those are the things that we want to use uh, to generate this. And I already ha I had to have this in order to write the code to generate it in the first place. So it's one of those situations. But um, but we're going to be starting to to do some code generation. So at this point, I'm going to start needing um, needing some tests. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and make a testing direct uh, tester. This is a standard directory name that is uh ignored uh i actually i think i'm spacing on this a little bit i forgot the name it's, it's either data or tester i can't remember i always i always space on that what is it find um name test uh what is it called examples no examples test no test data test data is what it's called did i call it that I don't remember. Let me go check. Peg in. Go. Uh, if you want to follow along, by the way, this is we are in the the PegX branch of um, uh, of uh, this this thing. Eventually, this will become master, and master will become original. But I haven't made that change yet. All right, so it's not tester; it's test data. I, I never remember test data. All right, so we have a test data directory, and now we can. Now, by the way, the spec directory in here uh, is a submodule. So that's uh, I use a submodule for that. That is actually the, the spec directory from the other screen here. Uh, it module is just it's just embedded within the Peg and Go project, so that I can use the spec directly rather than having a copy and trying to keep them synchronized. I can just do git pull and have it be synced. Mm. All right, so uh, we got two o'clock. So we need to generate code. What kind of code do we need to generate first? I think we should probably do this. This is kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, we really just have to walk the tree and say, hey, are you a definition? If so, you know, make this thing, right? Um, so I don't think that is going to be too hard to make. Uh, I'm also not against because code generation is is not a performance uh, thing. It's like a one time thing. You know, it's not it's not a runtime uh, hit. So code generation, I'm not afraid of walking the tree more than once and being a little lazy uh, rather than trying to do everything in one in one walk. And that will make the code easier to read. Hey, Zafida, how's it going? <clears throat> Zap, is it Zafida, Zafida, or is it Zapida, or Zapida, or Zapida? So we're going to go ahead and and um, I think for this, I think what we should do for this is actually just build an array. Uh, you know what I mean? I think we should just uh, we just build the array of definitions and then generate uh, generate these things by by through some other method. Interior historian, RBX Rob and Healthy Healthy Gamer all streaming right now. <laughs> Hard to choose. No, you, you yeah, I'm I'm just uh, Internet Historian is is streaming. He's awesome, man. Yeah. I love him. I was just watching him yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Just yesterday I was watching him. My yeah, my stepson's like a big fan and he's got me really turned on to Internet Historian. Really he's fantastic. Um yeah, I look. At least we have choices, right? I'm just going to be doing boring, boring GoLang code generation. You don't want to watch me. Go watch him. Go watch an historian. <laughs> Did you guys see AOC by the way last night playing Among Us? <laughs> she's so cute. She was so fun. You know, she's you know, the thing that's so great about her is how how completely obvious it is how serious she is. I mean, she's able to have fun, but she is one damn serious person and that's awesome she's able to have so much fun but she's able to be so 
so laid back and just the gesture. She understands that just the gesture of paying, playing an hour. See, as if you know, yeah, AOC, yeah, AOC played tw- played Among Us on Twitch last night. It made national news in America. Uh, oh, you maybe don't know who she is. She's, uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go punch AOC. Not punch her. I'm not. You know what I mean? <laughs> Promote. <laughs> so yeah, AOC. She's, uh, I swear to God, she's going to be the president in 10 years or five years. You watch. I'm not kidding. And, and, and this, this, you guys, before, before I die, <laughs> and definitely before you die, I predict AOC will be president. I'm going to predict it right now. I'm going to predict it. And, and if, and, and, in, and in my, uh, imagined future, Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg is her, is her vice president. That's that's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna predict that future, right there. Hey, Eric Dev is is streaming. We should go watch him too. He's awesome. I didn't I didn't know he streamed actually. I, why am I not following him? Welcome to his 178th hey, Bjergsen fan club. Oh it's wow, a he's doing a whole. Oh, no, that's an ad. What am I talking about? King will be joining us. Or now, I, this is our first time meeting him, so don't embarrass us and don't ask some stupid oh, no. questions. Bjergsen shaved his beard. Everyone, hide your beards. <laughs> hey guys! I don't even as know long as Bjergsen is, is ad, adored by fans, him. you can count on Geico saving you folks money. Tell. They Fifteen try minutes could okay, save you fifteen percent like, or more. We will do some. Oh, he's doing Rust. Eric likes Rust too. WebRTC magic. Yay! Art of Yorks, Rob. Thanks for the follow. Yeah. I'll be right back. I cannot believe I was not following. You know what? I'm actually breaking the rules on Twitch right now, so I'm I'm not supposed to do this. I'm sorry if, if you come across this. I wasn't trying to do this to pull followers or anything. Just so you know, I just happened to notice you were on, and I, I didn't realize I hadn't been following you. God, look at all these people who are on. I'm not following. How am I not following these people? All right, fine. Guys, just give me a second while I follow these people, and I'm going to come back. Practical Dev. This is Dev.io stuff, I think. Yeah, I don't know if that's dev.io. I don't know. Okay, he's good too. I should probably follow Microsoft Developer too. I'm going to follow all these people. Uh, 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 World of Warcraft, no. Uh, anyway, so I, I, back to what I was doing. Oh, hey, look, somebody's is watching me. <laughs> I, you guys, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to break the rules. I just was curious. I was trying to show AOC, and then I noticed you guys were there, and then I was like, wait a second. So... Yeah. Um, so back to <clears throat> back to generating code. Uh, so we're gonna generate these two lists first. I've already done this once. Uh, I have the code written someplace else. I don't know if I'm gonna use that same code or not. Um, it's already in Pagan One Pass. Um, first was it one file, and so I'm gonna be able to to kind of lean on this because I've already tested. Uh, I don't know where it is though. Let's see, defs. Um, where did I put that? I put in major pagan pagan dot go. Yep, scanner. Nope, that's not it. Let me see where it is. Um, hmm, is it in the scanner. No. Hmm. Well, I mean, it, it, it it's not going to be bad for us to redo it if we have to. But uh, defs. Definition structure. No. Anyway, um, well, are we, I mean, it's it's not that bad. Let's go ahead and do it. So the way you do this is you have to, you have to, yeah, to, you have to, um, you actually walk the tree. So let me just give you a sense of how I'm going to do that. I have a um, in the node tree that I made some time ago. Uh, there is a thing called walk. It's either called walk or visit. Did I call it visit? I call it visit. Okay. So this, this, uh, what it does is it visits every tree like we talked and, uh, every node in the tree and it goes from the top down and, um, you know, it gets all the good stuff and this is, this is really cool. It's really fun. Uh, you can do anything with this. In fact, I, I got a little bit crazy down here and I made an async walk, which, uh, according to the children, it, let me see if I can pull it up again and show you what that one does. Um, let me see if I can show you PDF uh, intro to algorithms. 
so this one is going to let me see if I can get back on my where is it? Did I pass it already? Do 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 yeah so uh this this it's this async one does this it starts here and says do I have any children and if it does it say it says fork off a routine a go routine for this one this one and this one all at the same time and then this it says do I have any children yes fork off a go routine for this and this one basically it fork bombs uh if you know what that is it fork bombs a traversal of every single thing and it probably has a proper name uh uh, but but that's that's how it gets through the whole thing um and there's no guarantee that anything's going to happen before another thing so so that is not the the appropriate algorithm uh to use for this particular thing but i do like having it because you know if i had a complicated notary which i i probably will actually the reason i'm doing this is because like when we get done with this i'm going to be like parsing like knowledge bases and stuff and i might want to i might want to create a database of all the words in there and and in that case i'm going to be like definitely doing an async because i want to be able to get to all the words and just put them in a, a big collection and then put that collection in a json file somehow so the speed of that is is going to be important and i know this is kind of a kind of a cheap there's better ways to go through uh, a no tree and a graph there's like all kinds of graph theory about how quickly to get through it uh everyone in the visiting salesman program problem i've heard about but but you know this is good enough for most of the stuff so we'll see um and because we already have concurrency built in to go uh we just have to you know set up a maximum number of forks of uh, of go routines and then do that so that's there so this this hopefully has familiarized you a little bit with how we're going to do this uh, we're going to use the visit um, the visit function from the node tree I, I built some time ago and and do a depth first search and then it, we're going to ask ourselves at least for this first thing we're going to say okay what is uh, we're going to look for all of the uh, node defs we're going to look for actually identifiers we're gonna look for all of the identifiers um where are they so let me show you the grammar again we're gonna look for we're gonna look for um sorry we're gonna look for all the definitions so we're gonna look for anything that's a definition so we're gonna say do i have a node def a scan def a class def or a token def right and if i do uh, I'm going to assume that they come in order and, and therefore I'm going to increment a number for each one as I go, uh, as if I had just grepped it out of the, out of the thing. Now that, 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 and then that's, that's, that's the first thing we're going to do. So it's not going to be very hard because we just have to write a function, but I want you to understand what I'm writing before I write it. So we just have to write a function that says, are you one of these three, four things? Are you one of these four things? If you are, print out your value. You know, print out, print out uh, the number and increment that number by one. This is why it can't be asynchronous, right? And and that's all. So this function is going to be rather easy, um, and uh, it has a lot of similarity with the find command if you're familiar with that from Linux, Unix. Um, so let's go ahead and try it. Where do we write this code? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I've been thinking about putting it in the top level and calling it generate in here. Uh, but I feel like it's kind of enough to be in its own file. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it ready, just if you're new to go, a, any file in this directory is considered a being in the same file. So the only reason to separate something into its own file is just for clarity and to make test cases that go against it and not have to be overwhelmed by that and there's you know there's big debate about how long your files should be and functions and all that and whether it's easier to manage with fewer files or more um you know but but uh for right now i, I guess uh I, I mean i guess i can just write it right here um and call it a good call it a day uh you know i don't know I, well if, if we need to come back to it later we, we can't i i i i don't well I, i'm gonna change my mind on that so i'm gonna make a file called generate or gen um and the reason for that is because i like being able to go to the top level of the directory and zoom right in on the stuff i want uh and and that if there's a few more files in there i that's fine 
You know, I, I like to be able to visualize where the code is, uh, particularly when you get a complicated code base. Uh, it might not have a lot of code in it, but I want to be able to find it. So uh, I'm going to, somebody disagrees with me on that. Uh, I'd love to hear your reasons why, and I'd be happy to entertain doing it a different way. Um, and so then what? Well, um, so, so yeah, we have, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting distracted by some of the other files right now because this is a pretty, very long name. It's a very short file, but I, I really don't like having structures. There's not going to be a test for that, right? Because I don't need it. I don't, I don't like having my structs in some people put all their structs in like a single file at the top level. And, um, I don't like that. <laughs> I just can't say, I know I, I like being able to see, see, but this expression doesn't need to have a bunch of test code for it. It could, it will, um, you know, but do I, do I keep the name short? Um, I don't know. Um, so anyway, these, I spend way too much time on, I really OCD out on that kind of stuff. I, 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 I shouldn't. <laughs> so, I mean, for example, all the top level functions right now are all in peg and go. So these are like, you know, package entry functions are all here. If I, I like the ability to go to this one file and find it. And, um, you know, none, there, there are no other top level functions, uh, anywhere. It's, let me check if I have to be sure. There's definitely structs and stuff. Well, there's a top level. That's not fair because JSON is like its own thing. Well, there you go. So we've we've kind of I kind of allowed for a generation to to be to be in its own file. Um, should I call it generate? Or should I call it gen? Okay, touch gen. Gotta go. I I know I spend way too much time on that. Um, you know what? Let's make it a full word. Uh, okay. Generate. That's good. I mean, people might want to go. That. This is the other thing too. So if you have a, God damn it. I want to make a terminal typing practice. I think it's because of how my hands are on this new table. I'm sitting, I'm trying to find an excuse for sucking. So funk generate. So this would be, uh, the test code would be, um, we'll make some scaffolding for that. Generate. So generate is just going to return an error. Um, and what do we, what should we take? This is the, the hard part. Um, I'll just return nil for now. Um, uh, and let's actually make a test case for it. Uh, so we can kind of get a, our head around what this is going to look like. I'm going to start out with an example test. And, um, uh, this is just is how you do example tests and go. And this will immediately fail. There we go. Um, so we can kind of imagine what this thing is going to look like. So if I were to do pagan dot generate, first of all, we have to have it be pagan dot generate and error. So this is what we're, we're imagining. The reason I like example tests is because they go in your documentation for free and they give you uh, a chance to um, imagine what the thing is going to look like without the complications of test code scaffolding. So I love to kind of brainstorm about what the API for this is going to look like, you know, the signature and everything, uh, you know, doing this. Um, it's just, it's, it's, they call it test driven development, call it whatever you want. I don't care. It just helps me think in terms of how this is going to be used. Um, while you know still being feet on the ground with the code so okay so pagan dot generate um we obviously need to pass it something uh what do we want to pass it do we want to pass it uh the byte code of a grammar peg x i think we probably do want to put that um so peg x is uh we can pass a byte code or we could pass a string um I think we should probably have it be a string um, because, I mean, 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Or should we make it a byte slice? The byte slice is what we're going to get when we read it from the file, right? And so that's giving me an error because I didn't change the signature here. So, whoops. Peg X. Um, so let's do this. Let's make, uh, I'll put peg X here and we'll put some, some peg X together. Uh, you know what? I think generate, uh, is not going to be called enough for us to keep it in the convenience realm. Do you know what I'm saying when I say that? So, um, what I mean is that, uh, uh, grammar, uh, Okay, so what I what I mean by that is that this is this is kind of an architectural design conversation really quick, but when you're dealing with performance and this is a refactor of a working, you know, parser. So so I'm kind of thinking about performance a little bit better this time. And when you're talking about matching at things that are going to be running a lot so you know, like once you have an expression, the whole point of, of building up an expression is, is so you can run it and have it match very quickly without any extra code. Um, and it, this is why you see this in, in the standard library a lot. You see like match string and then you see like match bytes, right? So rather than having to force uh, a type switch uh, in every call, you just you you know up front when you're writing the code whether you're dealing with a string or a byte slice and so you call the appropriate function and therefore in your API you provide you know your package API you provide the the, the different ones depending on what type you're passing it and this is the case where templates the people who are arguing for generate for templates um, for um, generics and stuff like that because that would simplify this kind of thing uh, but and without having to do the type switch and and um you know i this is this is one strong case for uh for generics but uh and you know in c plus you have templates and stuff um but it's not necessarily needed and i believe it depends on how the code is going to be used and i guess the argument goes well sometimes you don't know whether performance is going to be an issue and how your api is used and, and i would argue that 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 it's it's probably better for you to have some idea about uh, how a particular function is going to be used from your API so that you can document it that way and say, hey man, this, you know, printf is not for high performance stuff. It has a, it has a, it has a varying length argument signature. Uh, it takes any, any number of different types. So there's a lot of type switching and stuff going on in there that is unnecessary if you know exactly what you need. And and that would, you know, it's, it's, it's milliseconds or nanoseconds of time difference, but it's still a time difference. So since we are concerned with optimization here at this point, you know, I want to ask the question, can I get away with a simplified API uh, or which would be what? A simplified API would be um, doing something like this. I'd be doing, um, you know, I'd be saying, instead of saying generate error, I can do this. I can say, I can be very precise and say, you know, what is the peg X, uh, oops, sorry, peg X, um, you know, I pass a string in. Now I have to pass a string in, right? Uh, and that's great. Uh, I could have, you know, generate, generate from string, generate from byte slice, generate whatever. But, you know, the usage of this um, is, is what's kind of dictating um, this, this decision. So uh, this is, this is a very, very high level API function that's designed to be kind of in user space, you know, like one layer away from being in a command where it gets called, you know, peg and generate, right? So peg and generate would just call peg and dot generate. You see what I'm saying? So the command peg and generate that has a main function would call, you know, peg and dot generate, but depending on what the arguments are. And, and it should be able to, it's going to pass in a string, obviously, that points to something. We're going to have to grab that buffer, which will be a byte slice. Um, but, but, you know, can we allow, can we simplify our testing by allowing a string to be passed in here without hitting, getting, taking a big performance hit? And I believe we can because it's at the top level. It's, it's at, it's at the very, very highest level of our API. In other words, it, it's not a low level performance thing where we're trusting everything to call it correctly. Uh, and therefore we don't have to do any validation. Um, so it's at a little bit higher level in our API and, and, you know, closer to the user space. And so I'm okay with making this an interface. And and interface un, un, 
un, um, uh, empty interfaces are highly controversial in Go, uh, and and I don't uh, find them as controversial at all. I really like it. It was it, it allows Go to replace Python without even batting an eye. It's just really easy because if you want to do with that kind of thing, another thing we could do is we could say, well, what else have we got here, right? If I really wanted to, I could get so generic. I could just do args, and then I could just say args is just a number of empty interfaces. Boom, I got Python now, right? And I can send whatever kind of arguments I want to this thing, as many of them as I want of any particular type, and now I've really fundamentally opened up my argument signature at the cost of performance, but we don't care because it's at the highest level of the API. So so I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, I but back to kind of doing our design here. Um, what do I need to give to generate? What do I need to tell it? Well, I don't quite know that yet. I know I know I need to give it the data, right? So we have to give it the data, um, and I don't know if I want to make that an argument. Um, yeah, another thing we could do is we could force the the buffered input, uh, you know, the pegx string to be the first thing, and we could make that an interface so that we can allow it to be a string or a byte slice uh, and then we have one or more arguments after that that are in any particular order or we can make uh, you know any other kind of thing um, another another option here would be for us to actually make a generator uh, struct that has information on it and um, to tell you the truth I think that this is this is probably going to be the right approach for this um, if you if you've ever done this, like with Marshall JSON, you know, the standard library for Go, uh, encoder, right? You can do JSON encoding uh, by creating an encoder and then calling encode on that, uh, or you can use the high level, uh, you know, Marshall JSON from. So they have a function that 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 instantiates one of the encoders kind of by default, uh, and you can do it. That's a pretty common idiom in Go is to have this you know super easy functional approach. Uh, peg and dot generate and then also allow you to create your own generator and manipulate the generator and then generate from that uh, I personally prefer that option uh, Rather than trying to pass in any number of config you know, configuration parameters into a very complicated signature um, So I believe I've just decided to to make a generator out of this and uh, uh, So generate will be the top level uh, but when then we'll also create a struct for the generator. Uh, I don't know if we need to put that first or not. I don't know. I guess it doesn't matter. Struct um, generator. Uh, oops, bad me. I'm like coding like C or something. Ah, type generator struct. And I don't know what's going to be in here for right now. We could probably put the uh, peg X uh, uh, walks into the podcast. Uh, so let's see here. We're going to go ahead and put um, the generator struct. We'll put, uh, uh, well, we need, I, I'm on trying to, you know, we could have the buffer. Uh, I don't know what to call it though. We could call it, what should we call it guys? Let's call like the thing that's going to hold the, the code. The generator peg x. I'm going to call it peg x. How about that? Peg x buffer. Um, I'm going to call it generator dot peg x. Peg x is the is the no. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> what do, what do we call the 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 grammar code? Um. It's the string, the grammar string. Um, I mean, I, I guess we could call it just grammar. It it's uh, it's it's the peg expression. I've been calling it a peg expression as well. Uh, in this case, because we are generating a grammar, I think it's more than a peg expression. A peg expression doesn't have to have an identifier. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm picking my names there, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. So a generator dot grammar. So we'll make a grammar, a byte slice. Okay. And, um, that's because that is what we will be passing to the parser. Um, and yeah, in this particular case, uh, the generator, the grammar is going to be set to be 
uh, you know, the thing that we're loading in from Pagan. I got to be careful. I think I'm getting pulled into being able to generate uh, other things as well. So I got to be careful with that because I right now I just want to generate my main one. But I think, yeah, we'll keep grammar on here. That would get us um, rid of this. So generate, what should we do with generate? Well, generate should take, uh, let's say okay, grammar. I'm going to say, I'm going to take in a grammar and nothing else. And we're going to use only defaults and we're going to return an error at the end. All right. So actually, no, we're going to return uh, a string. How about that? Uh, should we keep the grammar a string? We probably should because you can write it out. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's stick with strings because that's going to be the most easy for people to, to test. That's really why we're doing it this way. If somebody wants to force it into a bite slice, they can string. I think, I think I'm going to stick with strings. So that way we can get, we can get rid of that, that there. Um, well, no, let's, 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 let's leave an inter interface here. The API generation is very slow for me because I I want to think about what people are going to be using hundreds of times later. Um, I don't like it when people rush through signature definitions. Um, so what are we getting out of this? Let's say we're going to return out a string. Okay. So, so yeah. Uh, and that's going to be, uh, that's going to be the code. And we're going to give them an error. I'm going to go ahead and use uh, a full form signature like this, mostly because it's self-documenting. Um, so this shows that it takes in a grammar and turns it into code and sends an error. And um, just having string there would be, this gives me a way to kind of indicate very qu quickly just by looking at the signature, what, what's going on. Uh, which means I got to return some different things here. So we're going to return. Actually, I don't need this anymore. This is another thing that's, uh, a lot of people are uncomfortable with, with empty interfaces. A lot of people are. Um, and I, this is, as I, I spent a long time explaining just now, um, empty interfaces are designed for the higher level uh, functions in your API. They're not designed for the lower level things, you know. Uh, but if you don't have any empty interfaces, you, you know, you can't, you, you can't accept different types of arguments. This is what causes uh, Golang to kind of straddle the, you know, the bridge across Python or, a, you know, loosey goosey language like node or something and, and C of course, uh, or something like that. And, um, you know, there are generics on the way, uh, that take care of some of that, but, um, I don't know if it's worth it. I think empty interfaces are a brilliant idea to address uh, a problem that would otherwise keep Python programmers away from the language. Uh, because they want some, sometimes you want that, that high level loosey goosiness of a language, you know, and sometimes you don't, and you can make the decision as a designer about which one you pick here. And, and that's one case where I actually like having a choice personally. Um, and you know, uh, that's why I don't do Python anymore at all. I can write it and go much faster than Python. And I have a, a much safer, better time doing so because it's a strictly type language unless I don't want it to be. And then I make sure to test it. With, you know, it's got built-in test suites and stuff to protect yourself. All right, so we've got a grammar here. We're just returning here because it's because these these this also saves us from having to initialize these variables. They're all initialized with zero values. Uh, this one would be nil, and this will be an empty string uh, automatically. You don't have to do any work there, extra work. Um, and so what? So then I need to instantiate it. Uh, we'll do a type switch here. Uh, uh, I, 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 I default to type switching usually. Um, just cause, uh, there's other ways to do this, but it's, it's usually always end up wanting another, another type when you're using an interface. So I'm okay with just, even if it's only one type as if the default type is a string, uh, we just are good to go and oops, not default. What am I talking about? Case. So the case is a string, uh, then we're good to go. Um, and yeah, let me think here. So there's a string. Uh, do, 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 do. I think I could probably do this easier with a if statement, but I don't know. I'm over. I'm, I'm overthinking this as usual. 
So it could either be a string or a byte. So this tells me what I can accept. This is where generics people would come in and say, hey, I can do that better with generic. You probably could. Um, by the way, if you were doing this with the generic, it would be, I think if I can remember the syntax, uh, it would be generate t uh, grammar t. I think that's this. I think that's the generic syntax that's coming. Uh, and yes, they're using they're using. Uh, oh no, I take it back. They're using square brackets now. That's right. They were going to use curl. They were going to use parentheses, and then they changed their mind. They won't use this though because it's got another conflict with something else. So anyway, that's that's on the way. In case you're wondering, um, lots of videos on that. So what? So we have a thing. Uh, hi Santa. Yeah. Well, more so now than ever. <laughs> The really question here is, is I actually I want to be able to cast this thing. So honestly, I don't need this if statement at all. I mean, let's let's do the same thing without the switch. Just 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 for grins, because I'm kind of on stream here and you guys might want to see what's going on. So by the way, if you do this, this V equals grammar.type, V will be cast to the type. So the value gets gets the type that you want. Uh, but in my case, I wanna I wanna I wanna I wanna cast everything to uh, to be a string or to be a byte slice. So if it is a string, so I say, um, uh, and I, I don't remember the syntax for this, doing it. if I use the switch statement so much, does anybody remember? I have to go look it up. It's like, um, if grammar, if grammar, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's test it. Grammar, you can't do it to the same thing though. As the hard part. So let's say this um, bar uh, gr is a byte slice. This is probably going to make a copy though, and I don't want to make a copy of it. No, I'm going to keep my switch. Never mind. I'm going to keep my switch. So all we have to do is put the code in here that's going to load it. So that's fine to put it in two different places. Um, if it's a string or a byte slice. Oh, that's another thing. So if I want to, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to do this case uh, IO reader. So there's lots of lots of things we can do here. Um, so if it's a reader, a byte slice, or a string. This makes testing very easy, by the way. This is one of the reasons I want to do this at this level. Um, if it's a reader, then what? Uh, I'm going to have to read the bytes and then I'm going to have to pass off the bytes. I might have to have a, I might have to have a, a placeholder. I don't want to have it copy because it will copy the whole thing. It doesn't because it's strings and bytes are a byte slice is a pointer. A string is not so. So yeah, I don't want to. If I if I do if I do this, if I do var uh, buff is a byte buffer. Then if if I do that, if it's a string, if I do buff equals v, it'll do a copy. That'll work. Uh, but I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know. That's probably going to be optimized. I should probably not prematurely optimize that. Uh, and uh, buff equals uh, grammar. Uh, otherwise, uh, buff equals um, v dot read all. And uh, And then we check the error value. Actually, uh, if um, there's not equal nil, have to do this. Return, hi Mark, return, return what? Return uh, empty, 
Actually, no, I just have to return because it's already been set. This is a little bit odd for me. I, I, I don't normally use name name return values. Um, I, I like them for two reasons. First of all, I don't like it if it goes off the screen. If it's past 80 characters, I don't like it. If um, if it allows me to you know, save space in this, in the thing. Fine. If it's clear. Another thing too, is that these, if it, if these names are included in here and you do put a, a defer, if you cap trap a panic with a defer, I found out earlier in the week, uh, that they, they can be used as, as kind of pseudo enclosures within, within your thing. Otherwise you don't get anything. Any of the values inside of your defer function are lost. They're not used. So, so naming the return values are kind of a, a way to bridge, uh, data between uh, a panic and and its um, and its sort of trapping trapping um, function. All right, so I'm going to finish this switch statement. I'm going to take a break and go get some coffee um, and wake my legs up that fell asleep. <laughs> okay, so buffer error vehicles read all. Um, uh, can I use grammar type interface type byte and sig sign type assertion? Where is that? Fifteen. Uh, type interface as type byte in assignment need type assertion. I just did it. Oh, the V. The V is where you so see that error I just had. That's a good that's a good out learning opportunity. So did you see what I had before? I had grammar. This is a really common beginner error, and I keep getting sucked into it all the time. So if you're just using the grammar and you're switching on the type. You can switch on the type without the without this assignment, and if you do so, it you you'll have to do this instead. You'd have to do this and then and do byte, which is super annoying. Beginner code, you see this all the time. They write this when they don't know that if you if you did this first, you put the v equals there in this in the type switch. You can use v, and it's exactly the same value that's been cast. So you don't have to rewrite the cast everywhere. So if you see a bunch of casts in a type switch without the without the, the assignment, the walrus assignment, definitely beginner code. So um, that's one way to get around that. Read all undefined type IO has no field or method read all. I think it's read, is it read full? Uh, I'm going to have to go look on IO and see what that is. Uh, I got the name wrong. Uh uh, io dot reader. Oh no 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 no! I think I know what it is. I, I have to do io util. I'm sorry, it's an io util thing. Io util. Uh, read all of the v. That's what it is. There we go. Left the clear but not used. Okay, that's good. So all of our stuff is working. This way we can pass a reader to it. We can pass. That could be a file handle, by the way. Um, we can pass. Uh, we can't pass a string as a file as a file, you know, path. We can't do that because you know, a string would be take. Uh, and if it's a string, if it's a byte, then it goes. Then then down here we have we have our buff. And so I can just right now just print out the buff. Um, so we can see what's going on with that. Actually, we'll cast it to a string because it's going to be just a bunch of numbers. Uh, it generates two values. Um, oh, we don't have a code thing. Well. Uh, Buff equals code. That's lame. I mean, code equals buff. Obviously, it hasn't gone through any transformation, but for right now, we'll to do uh, generate. So we're just getting all our parameters set up. Uh, I cannot use buff as a type string in assignment. Uh, oh, right. Well, I don't care. I mean, this is just temporary. We're going to get rid of this. 60k last night. So you don't need to breathe through a paper bag. How did you wire 60k? Because you're closing on that house? Wow. Yeah, isn't that fun? Buying a house is so fun. <laughs> we need to do it too. We have people in our apartment complex, work people, like literally walking in on us. They just don't even care. <laughs> they knock the door. They said, we hit the boat, you know, and yeah, uh, it's crazy that they have my wife is panicking. Appliance shortage, right? Yes, yes, I believe it. There's also a streaming shortage. Yeah, AOC went to go do her streaming and she couldn't find anything. She was talking about they were all frantic. 
because all the streaming stuff, like all the cameras and everything, they're all gone. Everybody's moving to streaming. It's insane. It's like COVID has is, is been horrible, but, but it has really transformed our IT world. It is like really like buying a house isn't funny. It's, <laughs> if you already have a ton of houses, you suck. <laughs> okay, boomer. It's not a mismatch, one variety, but variable, but peg and generate returns two values. Uh, it's so stressful from buying. Yes. Hopefully you guys can get through that. One variable match return two values. What are we talking about? Oh, my gen test. Yeah. Well, that, that I expected. Okay. So here we go. Um, error. Uh, so we need to do code and the error. Uh, code declare but not use. Fine, I shall print it. Just for now, I guess we're getting all set up. Got grammar goes to something and nil. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm gonna just put some to dos here. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Um, 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 I wonder if I should put them all in the same one. Uh, Generate string, and we're just gonna we'll add a lot of the other ones later. Let's do. I'm gonna I'm gonna make these so I can do them later. String, um, can I do that? No. Bytes, IO reader. I mean, minor, minor example tests on that. All right. Uh, we'll grab some coffee. Here's some fishies for you to watch. Uh, and then we're going to get back. We'll get to the, to the business of writing the, the walking function that's going to grab out all the definitions. And um, we'll go from there.
All right. Check, 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 check. <laughs> I had to make coffee. It took me longer than I wanted. Mm. My wife makes these best, these like pecans. All she does, she takes a little bit of butter and she, um, she puts maple syrup on them and she, she just air, air. We have a, you guys have an air fryer. They're so good. They're so cool. They're so much better. We haven't had a microwave in like four years and it just makes these really amazing kind of maple covered glazed pecans are really good. They go really good with coffee. I'm just saying. They're also good with salad. <laughs> just in case you were wondering. Back to generating some code. All right. So what do we want from this? For this, we would want to get at least one uh, AST. Oh, so good. So good. All right. Got to remember to eat, people. Uh, what do we want the output to be? So we want the code for this to... It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Um, some of these outputs are going to, are going to be kind of long. So we're going to have to kind of shorten them down just to get the idea. Um, so yeah, so let's, 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 let's just imagine. Let's imagine, shall we? Um, uh, we'll print the code, which should be a string, right? Um, Make sure we don't have an error. Uh, we'll print the error first. And then the code. So what should come after that? Well, the code should be, in this case, what should the code be? This gets going to be a little bit hard. Hmm. I might have to, uh, I might have to bail on my example test on this. You know why? Because... First of all, I don't think anybody really cares about what the output's going to look like. And secondly, I'm going to need to write the before and after tests, and I'm going to have to make those into files. And so that's kind of outside of the scope of, a, of an example test. It's more of a traditional test. That's why I created the, ta the, the data, whatever, the test data. Uh, so I am going to bail on the example test right here because 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 this is going to be a pretty long thing i was about to write like several lines and then i remembered that it doesn't do when you do an example test it actually truncates the white space at the beginning so it's going to be really hard to get a, a total match particularly because i want you know it's going to be code and i want the code to be an exact match so for that kind of thing uh i'm probably going to want to have files that get transformed into other files and that's going to be more of a just it might even have to make a, a generic test um, uh, I'm going to say test generate simple and let's do that so um, and we're going to do a simple string I'll put simple string uh, okay so we have this and and what do we get out of it so I'm going to actually do an evaluation on this. So I, I switched I switched gears, and that means that I have to actually do a, a test. I have to put the test in here. Uh, I can still keep it in, in the pagan underscore test package so that, uh, so that I have to write code that appears uh, like it would if a user were to write it. And this is, I have mixed feelings on this. When you're writing an example test, it's very clear that you want to do that because you're you're writing code that someone's going to actually look at and copy. Um, but when you're writing like test, just generic test code like this, uh, that's mostly just for you to make sure everything's working correctly and get your test coverage. And so, you know, enforcing the pagan prefix here is is you know, I don't know if if you want people, you know, developers to look at your 
non-example tests which don't make it into documentation and have it look like something that they could cut and paste into their their code then then your tests end up looking more like what they would end up with but if i do this and i drop that now there's like well do i you know now what right so that's not code that can be cut and paste um it makes it more efficient for you to write these kind of tests though and uh so I don't know if it's worth the extra effort. I, I'm always on the fence on that. I'm going to go ahead and drop it though for now. Uh, the other the other problem with this is that if you, in fact, I think I just changed my mind. Uh, if you do want to add an example test and have it keep it in the same file, then then you can have both types of tests. You can have the example tests that show up in the docs that show how to use the thing, and then you can have your own test as long as you use your prefixes and stuff, just like the other one. And it will not these will not land in the docs. If you do that, then you only end up with one test file. Uh, and another option for this is people do all the time is they'll create an examples. Um, they'll create an examples uh, .go file that or examples underscore test file, which has all of the examples for the entire package. And then they just use whatever kind of crazy testing that they want to quickly write in their underscore tests uh, for, for everything else. Um, I like that approach uh it's it's uh it has its drawbacks one of its drawbacks is that you know its advantages is that somebody coming to your code base could see every single documentation example in one file for the whole entire thing uh that which is nice right uh and they wouldn't have to you know sift through this combined thing but the the flip side of that is that when you're writing tests um you know, my my brain is already in test mode for like this generate thing. And so, you know, dumping out an example test here in the same file that happens to be, you know, similar to the to the non example test uh, is 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 more likely to be fresh in my mind because it's in the same file. So it really just depends on who you want to appeal to. If you want to heal, appeal to the people who are maintaining the code versus the people who are going to come to your package and try to learn about it by looking at your code. And, and that's a tough decision. I mean, those are the kind of decisions that I actually, you know, keep up at night on. And other people are like, why are you wasting time thinking about this? <laughs> this is why I'm so slow. Because I, you know, I have to think about these things. And, um, and but those, I mean, I, I believe in producing really, really high quality code, even if it takes, you know, double the time. And most of my employers disagree with that. Uh, I'm sorry if that's stopped my job prospects, if anybody's out there watching. Um, you know, I can speed it up when I'm not live streaming in particular. I could probably, I could probably triple my speed just by not live streaming, um, if not more. But, but anyway, um, so I, I, um, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to stick with another reason that I'm going to stick with the underscore test thing too, is I have found that I inadvertently make things private that should not be. Uh, particularly because I love to use sub packages. I'm not doing them a lot in this particular project, but um, and if you if you do not use the underscore test method of testing uh, in your package, forcing the use of the prefix for the import of the package, then you end up you end up missing uh, scope errors. Um, so you end up missing things that should have been public that aren't, right? And um, you know, then again, if you want to get to the nitty gritty, like for example, if I wanted to test, um, what is it? Compile, I think it is. Uh, where did I put that? Is that in the um, expression? I think where did I put that? Someplace in here, I have a compile, an underscore compile, and, and in order to test the underscore compile, I absolutely cannot do the other stuff we've been doing. If I wanted to just test the compile function. I have to do it without underscore peg. So there's no way to test it unless you use the other form of, of, of testing, right? And that argues for the practice of keeping all your exam your public examples in a public examples file and, and keeping everything else private in its own underscore test private file. So, you know, there's arguments every way uh, to do this. It's just really kind of a style um, if there was any other like, you know, veteran Go programmers out there who had input on this, I'd love to hear. But but I uh, I go back and forth between the two. Um, I tend to make a lot of my things public 
and to do the testing of the public interfaces rather than try to unit test it like this. In this case, I would never write a unit test uh, for the compile function because I can test the thing above it, right? You know, but, but there might be a case where I need to test the compile function. This one, this is compile helper function, right? Well, it's called by these other things, so I can test the other things. Now, if you if you if you want to get you know down and dirty in your unit testing and be able to test all your private helper functions, you know you're going to have a problem with that because you're not going to be able to get into this little thing and test it because you it's not going to be available to the scope of your test if you're using the underscore test method. Um, I don't know. So I guess it really depends on how many helper functions you're going to have. I tend to not have a lot of helper functions. It's just not how I do things. Um, but I've seen a lot of standard libraries that have a lot of, of private scope functions. And so I'm starting to think that that might actually be the best practice is to keep things in examples. It just so happens that I don't, I'm not, I'm not used, I'm not, I'm not hitting that best practice often because I don't need it because I tend to make things public. And, and, um, so yeah. Code coverage, I tend to obsess about it. I do too. Uh, I do. I, I obsess over code coverage. We all do. It's actually one of the faults of TDD, but uh, there's lots of videos on about people attacking TDD over this over obsession with testing the mocks and mocking the tests and spending all the time doing testing and not really anything in user space, you know, like user acceptance testing, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it is really easy to get caught up in testing, particularly when you have a, a test kit, you know, an entire test suite built into the language. Um, and look, how many minutes have I just burned on this, right? Like five or 10 minutes about how I should, how I should compose my tests. You know, you see other streamers, <laughs> they don't give a shit. They're like off and running, you know, they're making their code. They don't, they don't really care about how they organize their tests and stuff. And I, I, I'm, that's not me. I just don't do that. Even, even for a, an informal project, I, I have a tendency to not do that. Mostly because the test is where it's the, running the test is the easiest way in go to see the code running. You know, I've seen Go people that are like compiling all the time to test their code. I'm like, no, you don't need to do that. Put a test code, you know, unit test in there that does that. And then you can just test those things. And then, you know, when you're, when it comes time to like compile your command that uses this stuff, it's already, it doesn't need any testing practically. Um, so yeah, anyway, this, uh, this has me thinking about how, how I want my tests to be organized in this package in this particular package, uh, which is distinctive in that uh, unlike most packages, including the original master, so here's the master I'll show you, um, that we got working. Um, this is me like defaulting to my normal, my normal preferences, which are to make sub packages. And uh, you see, I have, uh, it, they look really nice by the way, because you have is dot whatever, and you can like not repeat yourself in your naming and stuff. It just, I just really, really like it. Um, However, this uh, does make a problem because, you know, you have to, uh, that, the whole public scope thing I just talked about. So, you know, if you want to test like one function and another private function that's from another sub package, you can't do it. So those tests have to go in those sub packages. The other thing I like about this too is it, it keeps, keeps your top level tree pretty clean. Uh, I'm not, I'm not willing to put a PKG in. I don't have that many lines of code to do that. A lot of people, a lot of Go projects uh, will put a PKG at the top. that has got all the package code in it and then they'll have a CMD that contains all the commands and everything. But I don't, I don't like making people, that's usually for projects where the, the, the result is not a reusable package that can be imported. I don't like unnecessarily making a really long import path uh, for the users of my APIs. Um, and including me, right? So, and and those are those are big considerations. And in this particular case, you see me using examples underscore test. Um, and and again, I you know I'm following this format, where this is you know this is all of the examples I ever want to show anybody, right? Um, and everything else is is buried away in, you know, like JSON test here is its own. Now this one actually has an example in it. So this this is one of those cases where, you know, do you put your examples here? You make them all in the same place or this is, this is mostly because this was written by somebody else. That's another thing to consider, too, is how many people you have on your project, right? So if you only have one examples file, then, you know, there's a good chance that someone's going to, you know, have a conflicting merge request because 
because they're going to be committing to the examples test file instead of the one that matches the file. So this is also why I tend to keep my files perhaps even too short sometimes because I would rather avoid uh, contributor merge problems by allowing, you know, by, by just, you know, making a nice clean line between what, where's stuff going. Um, it's also the reason that I, I, in this particular project, I'm shying away from examples, uh, an examples file. Um, even though I had it, I had it here. Uh, so I don't know. It's uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to stick. So I think I've decided, um, talking myself through this, that I'm going to stick with assuming that I can test everything from a public interface, um, which gives me 100% code coverage through the public interface. Um, it also helps me realize, uh, you know, GoVet will show you this, but, you know, if I've got any code that, that never is executed or that's kind of in the, you know, it's kind of in an eddy over here that doesn't ever get hit, um, and and I love that. By the way, I have a I have a, a you might like my GOC. This is a no tracking, code coverage, low coverage. What the heck? Yep, must not be anything there. Oh, I still have errors. Let me get rid of my errors. I, I created a thing that you guys might like. Um, uh, it's called GOC, and um, it is a it is a code coverage converter for links and if you're a terminal person and you don't want to have to use the code coverage that's built in that forces your web browser to pop up uh, I have a little cool thing that, that takes care of that um, what it does is it uses a Perl one-liner to to convert all of the uh, all of the colors for coverage into something that's visible from links and um, and uh, it just it does it temporarily in a in a temp file and then it will show you show you everything and I can show you how this works um, but if you are into using links, uh, and you want to do the code coverage on the terminal and you don't particularly care to fire up a graphic web browser just to see your coverage, which I think, think is fucking stupid. Uh, you can do that. So let me show you how to do that. If you want to copy of that, here you go. Uh, but it's not going to, I'm not gonna be able to demonstrate it until, um, I can actually uh, get this to go to compile. So let me fix my test and I'll show you how the coverage thing works. Uh, I don't worry about coverage till at the end. Um, but since you mentioned it, so here we have a generate code redeclared. Um, uh, how's it going, Gavinok? So, uh, so we had, so I just gave everybody a copy of GOC. Um, and error uh, declared, but not used error code declared, but not used. I should probably just print them. Right? Actually, no. Let's just do this. Let's just comment that out. I want to do code coverage. So GOC does this. You see this? So what it does is it 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 runs the code coverage uh, utility uh, that comes with Go, and then it 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 shows you the report, and then it opens links up, and it opens the report using a links terminal browser, which is what I use for everything, and and then it it highlights in red the stuff that's not being covered. See this? Pretty damn cool, huh? Super happy with that. And it was just a little hack I did one morning, and I was like, oh my god, this is so great. Because now I can see everything that's not covered right, right away. And I can actually I can actually have this running, you know, um, elsewhere and see. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can turn coverage into a text mode, but that, that just was the thing that I came up with. <laughs> so, so this is giving me red, all the stuff that's not covered. And then I can be like, um, uh, does this work with Gradle? Uh, you're talking about Gradle, the, the coverage tool from Java? Just for the folks at home, what is Gradle testing? Yeah, I yeah, Gradle testing, test task, automatically detects and executes all unit tests or tests. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a Java thing, is it not? I've always associated Gradle with Java only. Uh, build, build automation tools is that flexible? Ugh. A Java-based build automation tool? Uh, <laughs> gives me the creeps. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean anything personal. I just... Ugh. No, God, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> 
Uh, you got to use it. Oh, I feel so sorry, Gavin. Oh, my God, you poor person. When I was at IBM, I had to do that stuff, too. And it was just like, oh. How do they do in code ca Java bad, lol? <laughs> Dude, I can only say that because I coded it professionally for years. Uh, yes, it's a group box. Yeah, Groovebox is, 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 is not cool anymore. It's like yesterday's meme. Uh, <laughs> I love Groovebox because it's a, cause it's, you know, it carries on the Solaris, the, the Solaris tradition. OP equals poo. Agreed. <laughs> I, I, I wrote a, a guide on pragmatic object-oriented programming once. <laughs> uh, I'm taking a break just to drink my coffee and make fun of bad tech. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we have to use bad tech people. It's like not always our choice. I, I don't know. I don't know how you would ever do Gradle co test coverage because I don't know how it integrates with the Go tool. Um, I'm actually kind of curious to know. So, so Gavin, if you know, if you can maybe point me in a direction of how to uh, integrate Go testing with Gradle because it's built into Go, uh, you know, Gradle would have to have some sort of bridge into the Go built-in testing, I imagine. Um, you know, look at that. Anyway, so, so yeah, there's the GOC if you want to play with that. Uh, I, I, my coverage is 75.9% of statements are covered. What? I didn't think I had that high of coverage. I, I didn't think I had that. I seriously did not think I had that high of coverage. I, apparently I do. So, oh, well. <laughs> um, all right. So, so what was I doing? I am trying to test this i'm gonna i'm gonna stick with the um force the code to look like it was imported version and and use the um all of the i'm um, use the public api in order to test even the private methods themselves um therefore i don't have to i don't have to zero in on a single private method um because i couldn't by the way let me just remind you what i'm talking about so if i were to do this test test uh, compile right so even though I'm using testing form, I mean, I probably goes without saying, I don't need to do this, but I can't even comp call compile. You know, it's like, um, the equals, well, let's see, compile. It'll be like, nope, can't do that. Undefined compile. And there it is. Whoops. Ah, so there it is, right? It's right there. I should be able to call it, but I can't. Because why? Because I made, because I forced my test case to have, this is the, pack. they allow you to do this in your package definition. You can put underscore tests and then it will force you to use public scope for everything. If I get rid of this, I'll get a different error. Watch. Now it's like, oh, import cycle is going to die and kill us because of this. So now I have to take get rid of that. Now it's good. Now it's just a regular other error. It's fine. Uh, not of arguments to compile, but see how I can see compile now. So, so again, let me do that again. So I'm going to add back that. And so it's going to say, what's compile? I don't know. I can't see it. I don't know what that is. And down here, it's going to like, I don't know what generate is either. Because why? Because I have to tell it it's in Pagan and then it'll import it. So, so yeah, if you go with the method I'm going with, which is easier to read and gets you in a thought process of using the external interface, it also is more likely to help a beginner or anybody looking to your packages because even the... Even the the test code that's not in the examples will look like code they can cut and paste and use in their own code, and none of your tests will have will be will be using any sort of internal helper function syntax at all. It'll be they'll be forced to use the the public API, and therefore none of your tests will contain anything but the public API. Therefore, they don't have to filter through all the internal tests versus the public API testing. And I think I think I just justified my own decision. Um, time for more coffee. Be right back. This is not going to take long because the coffee is right there. What a wonderful day in the neighborhood. A wonderful day for a neighbor. Could you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Hello, neighbor. I saw that. Uh, watch me get a copyright strike for singing that song. <laughs> I, 
I watched that movie the other day. It was a really good movie. Uh, code declared but not used. Yes. All right, so now we can do our testing. So I did all that just to justify what I'm about to do. So I got rid of the example-based testing. I'm just going to do a basic test here because we're going to say, well, what should this actually look like? And uh, to do that, I'm going to need to pull in some files um, from the test data. So let's actually make one first. So let's put in the test data file. Test data is a function is a directory that's ignored. Uh, test data and any and anything that begins with underscore is ignored in the Go directory. Uh, the compiler won't even look at it. So it's a good way, good place to hide stuff. Um, and we're gonna say uh, generate simple. Uh, I don't know. Simple dot uh, dot uh, dot what dot go. Can I do that? I think I can. How about gen simple? It's just a file. So you actually can't include dashes in file names. I don't think. Have I? It's generally frowned upon. You know what, though? I like dashes in file names. I would rather have dashes and underscores. Or easier to type. But I'm just gonna, I, I'm just curious. I haven't tried this. Um, Fusum.go. Uh Hello. Uh, funk. Wait, let me fix the other thing. I, I think I can actually have dashes in my file names, but that's probably a bad idea. Because they already use underscore for the underscore test. Thing. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. I, I, I'm just a curiosity. I've, I've been wanting to know about that. I don't think it's getting to it, though. So let me... Let's just try something else. It's funny. I, I, I end up s sampling all kinds of things with you guys live that I would not mess with otherwise because I just think it's, it's fun to experiment. Yeah, apparently you can put dashes in there. The little feature of Lisp is you can have as many dashes in a function name. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I love that. I love dashes and function names. I would I would be all about that. I would much rather have dashes and underscores, but, you know, what does my opinion count? Mixed case is the standard for, for Go, but everybody throws that to the window. Mm. I can't tell you how many times I've seen snake case in Go code. Standard libraries, even. Um, where did I see that? Maybe it was a standard library. I have to go confirm that. Um, anyway, so we got this code. It's failing. Uh, what do we do? I'm going to put some test code. That's going to be the code that I anticipate would be generated. Uh, how much time I got? 3.18 already? Oh my god, I only have 40 minutes. Well, let me see if I can get at least one of them started. Um, why did this not show up? No, no, uh, uh, no. The official Go docs say to use uh, mixed case, camel case. Yep. There's very specific times when they have used underscore. Uh, in the test cases, in the example test cases, uh, um, so in the example test cases, uh, there's a very specific time you're supposed to use underscore because they use reflection to split on the underscore and do all kinds of things. This becomes uh, the in the documentation. This becomes a capitalized word next to the scan string function. Um, that's the only use of underscore. Everything else is uh, you see. Well, you know what? They they don't. I wish they did. So but now you'll see my code. A lot of times I will use C like functions. Um, but this is, um, you know, mixed case like this, very, very JavaScripty, right? That is the um, way to go. I, I personally, personally, I, I like using mixed case for public things. And I like using underscore snake case for anything that's private. And, and I, I don't even apologize for that. So you saw me using the 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 um the what was it the compile where is compile which one is it I don't even remember is it expression so you'll see me using um I I this these are leftovers from my Python days uh, I, I I it's just me but I have to use underscore for like helper functions it drives me crazy if it doesn't have it. <laughs> 
that's a that's a very much a Perl and a Python thing. I mean, we because there's no scope limitations in that those languages, and so putting initial underscore to indicate private helper function has long been uh, a practice that's been really really embedded in my brain, and so I have a hard time doing that. Which means that if I have a helper function, I'm more inclined to do this than I am to do to do this. And, and that's just my style. You know, if I have an option to do something myself, anything that's a helper function and it's private is, 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 is snake case. And anything that's part of a public API, uh, which it means it always has an initial cap, uh, gets, gets mixed case because go requires you to use an initial cap to export a function. It's part of the language. It's, it's cool. I love it, but it's people hate it. Mac's not here to yell about that, but Dash P, so string dash P, capital letter dash P. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know about that. that's that's that gets close. That gets into Hungarian notation stuff like that, and I fucking hate Hungarian notation. Uh, <laughs> that's just me. But all right, let's try this gen test. Uh, we got that. Okay, what am I doing? I am trying to make. And it takes me forever to do anything. I know. I'm sorry, guys. But I'm trying to make it in instructional as I go. Um, so test data is uh, we need to make an example of what uh, generate is going to look like. So I'm going to call it gen simple dot go. Uh, I'm going to leave the underscore out because I want to consider that part of the name and not some sort of like underscore test convention. So this is where we're going to actually write go code. Uh, that we want to be generated and uh, we'll assume um, well that's interesting actually let's uh, this is interesting this is really interesting this is not into the dashing code that's just me yeah people are they have their preferences for sure um, I, I absolutely hate Rust syntax. I'm just going to tell you. It's got everything. It's got everything I hate about every syntax in it. <laughs> look, all of them combined. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I, look, whether or not the language is good for what it's, you know, proposes to do is another question. But the syntax is completely abysmal. I hate it. Hmm. You find, you think, you think Rust is more readable? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I hope you're never on my team. <laughs> You're probably a great programmer. I'm not attacking you. I'm just saying I just would hate to have to have go through that conversation. I'm justifying. <laughs> oh, okay. I was gonna say <laughs> uh, nothing. Plus, nothing personal. I just the reason I won't ever code Rust on a team is is because yeah, in code, right? That's what I meant. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I was being nice, Mark. Uh, anyway, so we, let's pretend what kind of code we get generated here. So. Um, this is we're not. This is not code we're going to be evaluating. This is code we're going to be, um, you know. And 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 by the way, for the record, I would definitely be okay with working with people who have to code in Rust. But if I had a choice to work on a team where it's coding in Rust or work on a team that's coding in Go or something else, I would be more or C even. I would be much more likely to work on those teams. It doesn't mean I wouldn't work with you. It just means that I would, I would not want to have to have that, you know debate around a table about about you know whether tabs or spaces are better <laughs> people do that in tech uh, package i need to change this so so we definitely want to be able to define our own package i'm going to say uh some what should we say some pkg actually i'm just gonna do my pkg all right so this is going to be dinner gener generated now this is not this test code is not going to be evaluated as go code this is just code for we're checking what's going on, right? So, so what? What do we want to have happen here? Well, let me go back, and I'm actually going to reuse this window over here. Um, this happy little window over here, and we're going to look at generate. Uh, generate. All right. So, we got all this stuff over here. Uh, what else do we need? We need. What else? Um, we in our test uh, test code, yeah, gen test. Let's look at that. 
that's what I was doing. All right, so here we have, what if we, if we were just going to do the absolute minimum, right? Like just generate a grammar uh, and, and, and one, actually that's completely inaccurate, there we go, uh, grammar and then one, one uh, class identifier, that's what these are. And what would that look like, right? So what kind of code would come out of that? Um, and 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 let's uh, let's examine what that would be. What we're going to be doing down here is we're going to be doing we're going to be compare uh, code to uh, test data uh, slash gen dash uh, slash gen slash uh, simple simple uh, simple string. Um, simple string that go and um, so that's what we're talking about doing let's go ahead and fix that let me go move this let me do that so I'm going to leave live in test data over here uh, or vice versa actually you know what I'll put you I, I always have this is like my brain looks at this side of the of the window as being testing stuff so having code right writing code over there makes me uncomfortable Isn't that weird it's very weird. You get used to your own things, you know. Um, gen dash simple into simple dot go. Actually, no, simple string dot go. And we'll put that into the gen directory. Uh, all good. And then over here, we'll go back to our test. Um, gen test. Okay. And then over here, gen test. Oops. All right. And so we want it to have my package. And then remember, we need to make the, the list. That's the first thing we're testing is this being all along list, right? So do we want it to be at the end or the beginning? Probably at the end. I think the definition should be first and these big long tables should be at the end um, since it's just all going to get compiled. So we should have it say var node uh, types and there's another thing here that we're going to be talking about um, up front which is going to be scope so when we're doing code generation sometimes people are going to want to generate code that doesn't have anything in the public in the public eye so to speak uh, but this first test is just going to be I'm making it exactly as I've already done it and we're going to keep that so this is literally going to be the same uh, node type lookup uh, this and this unfortunately is not going to be that. This would be um, peg and dot node. I, I almost think that the. I mean, the generation that I have happening over here is not prefixed. Uh, eventually, we're going to have to add a prefix, but let's not deal with that right now. Okay. Um, I don't like that it's going to do this. It's going to try to clean up my code because it's dot go. You know what that means? That means I have to make these files not be go at the end because I'm actually testing them as text files and I want to test the text output. So I'm going to change it to TXT, which means I'm not going to get any go formatting, which is what I want. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Because, because yeah, I, I want to just, I don't want, if I, if I don't do that, it's going to, my formatter is going to freak out. Um, so yeah, so so we want to check the word letter for letter everything what it's going to look like, and this this helps me like visualize what the code, the generated code is going to look like for any given given thing. Um, so here we have please, is that a, is that a do tab? Please tell me no. And this is going to be hard too because yeah I can't because it doesn't know it's go so it's, I'm not going to get a free tab on this fuck. Um. Also, it needs to be local. This is going to be really hard because I already know that the definitions file is going to have to have all the parser stuff in it. I don't want to get bogged down by that right now. 
I'm wondering if that means that I should probably do it as a go file. So something that I haven't talked about a lot is that this uh, auto-generated file, uh, not only is it going to have to contain all of the definitions for the grammar, but it's going to need to contain all of the code from this package. This is why I didn't do subject packages because it's going to have to contain all of this code from this package so that it can provide the accessor methods to it that can be used. You know, all those methods and functions and everything need to be available to the, the package that's using it. The idea here is that you can do pack and generate and you'll get a single file um, that, that you can then use in your project uh, any way you want to parse anything from that grammar. And the reason that came up just now in my head is because when you, you know, I was complaining, I, first I was put off by the fact that it auto imported. Um, what the? At first I was put off by the fact that it auto imported Pagan here, right? Uh, but that is that is actually a hint about what will have to be ultimately included in the final version. So um, I think having those hints as we go along is not going to be bad. Not to mention the fact that um, when I need a tab, which I do, uh, my editor is going to put the tab in for me right now. Um, so, so yeah. So the reason that we don't have... Uh, the pegging in here is because I forgot for a second that th these files are designed to be used inside of uh, another project. This also brings up the the idea of of, of, of naming um, conventions and and conflict. So I need to test another version where we pass them, we give it a give the generator a parameter that says invisible or visible or whatever, and and then people get this instead, right? Um, or or whatever, but we need to be able to make it so that there is guaranteed to be no name conflicts uh, in this singular file. And that's we're back to that. I was doing that like three weeks ago, and now we're back to it again. So lots of little details that have to go into this um, this even this first minimal generation and um, generation tests, and uh, that's all good. So we want to be able to open that and then compare it. So let's just do that. Let's just do, um, let's say, good equals, um, actually, no, let's say want equals uh, iOutil dot read uh, file um, gen uh, simple dash string dot go. And I think we need an error here too. Um, all right, so here, here we have another error. I just need a var error this. And I don't know. What's code? Code is a string. Wants is a string. Actually, I can put that here, I think. Can I? I, can't, I don't know. I've never done it on the same line. <laughs> No, I can't. Var code wants are both strings, and uh, pegx is a string. But I don't. I guess I can. Sometimes I'm okay with declaring them this way, not using a wireless operator. I just think it just depends on the day. That's what the wireless operator does. It 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 infers the type, which is another kind of Python esque thing that Go does. Hmm. It just rids me of the wallet operators everywhere, so I can just reuse my variables, which is fine. I do need to test the error thing here, though. And, um, and yeah. So what is this going to look like? Well, we wanted to have uh, one type. So the no types, let's, let's look at that again. Let me look in the defs. Um, all right. So we want to have a by string. These are necessary for doing all the JSON mapping and stuff. And we want an int here. And we're just going to have grammar one. That's all we're going to have. Grammar one. And that should. Yep. 
And let's go down here and then grab the other thing that has to be here, which is by int. By int. And we'll have an unknown for the number zero. And then what? And then a grammar for the first one. So that's, you know, we're probably going to have a lot more in there. I'm going to have to change these tests as I go. Um, but that gets us started. And um, right, um, cannot buy string if it was assignment. Okay, so let's do that. Gen test. Um, Oh, uh, right. That is a byte. That's right. I forgot about that. Um, I'll get that out of here. I mean, I mean, whatever. 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 Error has to be here, though. All right, so um, if error, I mean, this code's going to be around for a while, so I might as well put time into it. Um, uh, T.error, uh, error, error. And this is where I wish I could single line this, but it's going to not do it. Uh, what error? Okay. Uh, undefined want. I thought we did want. One is a string. No, one is a byte slice. What? Oh. I guess going to force a new one. Code declare one declare. Um. Yeah. Uh, if uh, if the string want does not equal uh, gen wait uh, code should do it the other way. Uh, this is where people a lot of people use testify or something like that. I don't think it's necessary to pull in an external dependency just for testing. It's a pretty big package too. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, to generate simple string. I mean, I can clean up those errors later. Uh, No such file or directory. I got two errors. So if you use fatal, by the way, watch. If I use uh, if I use fatal here, it won't do the other error. See that? So there's there's something new you might have learned. If you use error, it continues on and tries all the rest of them. If you use fatal, it's like no man. If that's not working, I don't care about anything else. So literally, it will kill all the tests. So that's just a little thing that I didn't know for a very long time. Mm. So it can be annoying because sometimes you might have you might have an error up here that some error below would cause an infinite recursion if the first error exists, and so you want to fatal that first error and never get to the recursion. Otherwise, you'll, your test will go forever and run off into la la land. Um. Open gen simple string go no such file or directory. Uh, because why? Because I put it. It's in tester, test data. Um, failed to generate simple string. Well, okay. Uh, take care, Mark. Sorry for beating you up. I didn't. I was. I was mostly kidding, dude. Okay, just say so you no. Know. Um. Let's go ahead and do. Um, 
I want to see what code is getting generated. Um, this is always hard because, y you know, do you really want to see it all, right? Um, one way to get around that is to do this. You could do, uh, you can do this. You can say uh, t.log and you could say what you wanted, right? Um, and, and, and then, then it doesn't, it doesn't mess your tests up, uh, because it, it won't show unless it's, um, you've got dash V set and I do actually. So my got has, 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 whoops. I have a, I'm pretty sure I thought I have a dash T. Oh, I think I have dash T by default on. So yeah. Anyway, um, code does not equal string want. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I mean, you could, I guess, I guess we could make this a fatal error. And check this is just silly. <laughs> Mac, be nice. Be nice, Mac. Um, all right, so, so what? Do I need to log the code? Nah, probably not. I'm going to leave that there, though, in case I want to later. Um, all right, so now, now our test framework is all set up and we can start to do some testing. So we can run our generator. This is why people don't like test-driven development because they spend the whole day running the test. I'm about out of time and now I'm finally writing the code. Um, we did write this code earlier, which is nice. Uh, but we haven't done any walking of the tree, which I talked about a lot at the beginning. I'm gonna try to get that in here. All right, so let's do that. Um, now I have a choice here. I can write the the function to be run, the first class function to be called uh, for each node, I can write that right here in line, uh, or I can write it outside the scope of this function. So uh, that is, you know, kind of just a minimal design issue decision there. Um, but yeah, if I put it in here, then I can use enclosures, which I'm going to probably do because enclosed enclosures are variables that are baked into the function when it gets called without using a global scope. They're really, really cool when you, when you understand them. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to choose to put my function here. Now you can't use func like this, like you can in Python, which is God awful. I can't believe Python does that. In Python, you write def and put it, bleh, it's bullshit. I hate it. Uh, in fact, go forces you to use uh, first class function assignment in the, in, within, within a block context, which is awesome because that's the way it should be. Uh, you can't even do that in Python. You'd have to add, put a def inside of a def inside of another def. It's but ugly. And um, so here I can do this by saying, okay, this is one of the best things about JavaScript too. So JavaScript people kind of default to this method of defining functions, which I really love because people be learning it, learn first class functions right off the bat. A first class function is just a function that you can use just like any other variable or data. It's just another type. Hmm. So here we go. We're going to put, um, we're going to make a function. So we need to make our action. What do we want the action to do? Maybe I'll name it something useful. So we want our action to just, uh, what are we doing here? We are, we're going to gather up, uh, again, the end result here is going to be, um, getting our, our test data. We want to have this thing be generated. So how can we generate that? Well, um, this thing right here, we can, we're going to make a template probably. And this, all this content right here in the template can just be looped. And, and this content right here can be looped as well. Um, and actually I need to do this. Did I spell that wrong? I did. Unknown. Did I spell that right? Yep. All right, so, so this, this is going to be part of the template, obviously. And uh, this content right here is going to be looped uh, in the template. We're going to use text template for that eventually. And, um, 
and yeah, we're going to go ahead and do that. So, so that means how, how would I loop through that thing? Well, I need to make, uh, I need to build a temporary struct that can be passed to the template generator, uh, that has all of these things in it. So in our function, let's just build up, um, a bunch of nodes. So let's actually, we know that we're going to, our generator is going to have to have, um, uh, uh, a struct of some kind that contains, the values that are going to be used for everything. It's going to contain the definitions and everything else. Um, and so, yeah, this is where, th th this is a little bit tricky here because I'm going to have to include the definite, yeah. All right, never mind. I'm just getting down a rabbit hole there. Um, so what can we do here? Well, let's say, we know we're pro I mean, I'm, we're assuming we're going to have some sort of, um, oh no, it's not here. What, 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 what do we want to call this? We want to call this, uh, this is where we kind of get into the definition of a pagan grammar. Um, and we already sort of have that, right? We have that in our own, this is where it's a chicken and the egg thing. We already have these, these, these things that are defining what a thing is, right? Um, but we kind of need another version of it so that we can capture, uh, an entire grammar, um, in, in code as well, so that that can then be translated into the template when it gets written out. Um, I don't want to add an unnecessary layer of abstraction, so I'm just thinking about this a little bit harder. Um, so... Uh, we, we definitely have to have a struct to pass to the template and so right now let's just do this right now we know that we need um, an array and that is all we just need an array and the 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 items in the array are going to be you know what the numbers are so we just need an array with all the names in it. So let's just, let's, let's stay simple here for right now. We might have to move it out, but let's say, I, okay, I need to define um, an array and it has to be outside the scope of the function. So this is really important. We're going to use a closure for this to, to collect up all of the, the, the grammar names. Okay. So the way we do that is, uh, first of all, we define it outside the scope. So we'll say var, um, we'll, we'll say, um, uh, what are they? Identifiers, idents, I guess. Um, yeah, idents. And then we can say, um, make that an array of strings. And that's all. That's all we need. And what? Then we need to make our function. So we can say, uh, I mean, I don't know. We could say get idents. You know, I don't even really need to do that. I could even do an inline function without even assigning it, um, which might be fine. So what we do, let's just try that. It might be fine. I might not necessarily need to give the function a name at all or even assign it to a variable. I could just put it in line. So, so let's do, uh, we need to write the function. So we need to do n, wait, we need our node. Where is our node? Do we, do we have a node tree? Um, what do we have for our node tree? We have to convert it to an AST. So, oh boy. I, this is, this is not making me happy. <laughs> I think we have to convert the grammar to an AST before we can get the idents. Yes, we do. Damn it. Um, I'm going to have to do the, the first one by hand, aren't I? God damn it. I've been trying really hard to avoid having to do that. Because, look, I'm not going to be able to walk it because I, I don't have the AST yet. Of course. God damn it. <laughs> People have been reading my video titles and they're like, this guy, oh God, this guy keeps teasing us. Um... Okay, so the reason I thought that we could do this is because we wrote all of the other ones by hand. Did you guys see them, right? 
in here. So all these AST, these are this is this is this is everything that we're gonna have to have, and I'm trying to get away from having to write all that code. And I was hoping that from the AST I could do the generation. Wait, I can. Wait, I can do it. I can. I can do it. I can do it. I can. I can. I can. I can. I can. All right. All right. Right. Rob, come on, calm down. Um, I need to bring in the the AST from Pagan, which we don't already have built in. I'm starting to think that we need to build that AST. Oh my God. So I already have a, a to do here. Um, yeah. Uh, So, so here's what I'm going to have to do. This is something I do not want to stick around. But we, in order to do this, we actually have to load in the JSON AST. So we have to create a new node, and this stuff should already be built in to to the to the app. But it's, again, it's it's hard to distinguish in my head because it's like a time travel thing. So we need a new node uh, for our root for our AST. So we're going to do AST equals, and we're going to create a new node. Um, a node, and um, then we're gonna unmarshal. Um, we're gonna get uh, unmarshal JSON from, in this case, the spec. This is why this has to be written in. Okay, I, I this is good. This is good. 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 I'm going to be able to do the AST, but I, but I need to, we need to get that, we need to generate that code so that it exists um, automatically already. And it makes me think I need to, I need to write code that takes the JSON AST and generates and walks the entire tree and makes, makes a node tree that matches it by default. Yeah, because you don't want to do these all the time, right? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually replace this later. I'm gonna I'm gonna really cheat. I'm gonna use the the init function to do some code uh, before compilation. Um, so this is this is a sort of a way of cheating. And building ourselves a node tree without having a node tree written, uh, so that we can do the other code generation. And in which case, we won't need to do this anymore. Um, if you follow my meaning, I almost think we need to have a hard coded. Uh, yeah, well, I'll we'll come back to that later. I'm just going to stick with what I have for now. So, so yeah. In fact. AST that go. All right, so let's do this. Let's make um, a function. No, we're going to say var. Yeah. Var AST is a node tree. Yeah, I'm glad we're doing this because this is something I need to do. I marshal JSON, and yeah, I, I'm. This is a total hack for now. So we're gonna just grab stuff from spec. Actually, uh. I know you don't like buff. I don't know what else to say. Um, the buffer is going to be util.readall, read file, uh, spec slash ast uh, um, hmm. 
No, we already have those. All right, so AST dot short, so we can use the short form. That'll, that'll be faster. Um, I'm going to ignore the error for now. It's because this is temporary code. Um, let me just make sure that that's working. So I'm going to have to go here pretty soon. But uh, the reason because is because we have to convert that JSON code into into uh, an actual thing that we can that we can do. Hugo Drax, oh, sad. Um, generate. Uh, um. Yep. AC don't want Marshall JSON. Amount of arguments. All right. Okay, Marshall JSON buff. Uh, I didn't declare but not use. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Print buff. Um, we're going to use those later. Uh, Failed to generate a simple string. Okay. Uh, what I actually want to do here, I have to, I have to try something here. Um, <laughs> let's do grammar equals something. Let's do... Uh, I want to do something here. Node, wait. Um, AST dot print nil. Fuck. How is it nil? I want to see the error. Where is the error? I gotta go here pretty soon, people. <laughs> um, you think? Uh, this is this is not. The problem with panics is uh, they don't show up when it, in init functions. It's kind of annoying because they get try. It's it's weird. Huh. Why is it not running that init code? Buff. Oh, wait, wait, wait. This doesn't have an AST yet because it hasn't been defined. So init, oh wait, definition comes first, so it has to be above it. I don't think that, it doesn't matter if it's above it or anything. That should be fine. What the fuck is happening here? Come on, there we go. Please tell me you got this red in. Okay, I gotta go. Um, sorry guys, we'll get back to it next time. We're gonna start walking the tree. It turns out I have to create that. I have to convert the tree from being JSON into an AST, which means I need to create an AST node thing. Um, but I got work to do. See you later.